the projector. Well, if you see, there is not a lot of time here between. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. A computer working? Or a projector working? But can you say the presentation is better than here? Or can you say it like a... No, it's a, it has to be a PowerPoint. But it's not a problem with the presentation. It is a problem that the um, computer and the uh, connector are not uh, working. The 45 minutes uh, timeline is already started, no? Кому точно нужен перевод? Honestly. То есть кто ничего не поймет без переводчика? Okay. So have, Может быть, тогда мне просто сидеть и наслаждаться? Наша презентация очень интенсивная. It's, uh, it's gonna be very interesting, but we have uh, like a reduced amount of time. Но очень интересно, но, к сожалению, мы ограничены по времени. So I will be running. И я буду говорить очень быстро. Uh, let's see. So maybe, maybe we avoid translation? No, like I would say, uh, let's try to keep it short. That we're never gonna fit in the 45 minutes. Like uh, this is like uh, for sure. So I'm sure like to make uh, your work a bit frustrating. <laughs> but um, as you wish. Do you want to put it there? Yes. Are you serious? We can to now come on. But this uh, this projector doesn't have uh, the other entrance as well, or not? Как насчет того, чтобы те люди, которым точно нужен перевод, мы бы сели с вами компактно, и я бы переводила вам отдельно, чтобы не тратить время на перевод в микрофон. Да, нет. Все, все остальные рискуют, и я понял, что это перевод. Хорошо. I think you can speak because nobody wants to interpret the interpretation. So I will sit just with people who will read the interpretation and translate. Why don't you like sit with all the people together with them in that case, so that uh, you know, like you're gonna be close to all the people that uh, are listening to the translation. And yes, while I speak, my, that's exactly. My Okay, then it's, uh, that's fantastic. So and you will just keep your speed and... Ребята, yes. у нас есть место чуть впереди. Давайте мы все сядем в учение немного и будем смотреть на плазму, потому что с плазмом какая-то непонятная вещь so произошла. So и и у нас есть пока весна для спереди. Are you trying to make it work? I mean, uh, I tried... Because this is like really good. It's not like a... We're gonna have like all the people like move like that. Uh, I know, I know, I know, I know. I know. You can start. Oh. I don't know where you go. several years like working for corporation like Procter Gamble or IBM and uh, 
it's fine, you know, like it was an intended prostitution. And today I'm happy that I managed to get that hell out and do what I actually like, which is uh, collective intelligence and social innovation. Two things about myself, you know, like I love doing trainings about for social entrepreneurs. So we did it with my wife uh, in 14 different countries from Germany to Japan. And uh, yes, my wife is also my co-founder, which is something that I never recommend if you want to have like a quiet <laughs> life. Because uh, mixing love and life, you know, it gets complicated. But uh, if you're crazy enough, you know, like it can also bring to good results. So what are we going to be talking about? We're going to be talking about a new paradigm. Like something that is changing and we're going to be changing, looking exactly what the hell is wrong, you know? And uh, what I mean something is changing, you know, like I look at history like usually looking at generation, you know, like how generation are actually like uh, changing. And our grandparents' generation, those people came out of the Second World War and uh, they were the one uh, taking care of the reconstruction. It was like, uh, you know, those people made sacrifice and they actually got to the point in which uh, our parents' generation, which is people that are in their 50s or 60s today, they started having uh, an unprecedented amount of wealth compared to all the previous times in history. In fact, you know, like uh, the GDP, like uh, so the gross domestic product kept growing. You can ask to your parents, I'm not sure you're in Ukraine, I'm talking about Italy, okay? But uh, every year would actually be better off. And you know, there was like, they started like a new, uh, like a uh, era of like uh, people doing uh, new products and service that were increasing the quality of life of people. And then it comes our generation and it looks like it's game over. Like uh, what happened, you know? Like uh, the economy is in the toilet. Like uh, that's one of the first thing that I like to say, but uh, you know, like uh, we are at the end of the global age of consumption. Why? We started realizing that the GDP of countries or companies, etc., it cannot grow indefinitely. So you switch on television, they keep talking about growth, but you cannot have infinite growth if your planet is finite. Your planet is limited, economic growth cannot be infinite. You are losing biodiversity. We are having like a huge problems like with uh, how the weather is changing. We're gonna analyze it later. One percent of the of the richest population like uh, gets uh, over twenty percent uh, like of the global wealth. Like we are not solving the problem of uh, inequalities like not as fast as, as we should have done, and we have lost a little bit track, you know, like of the real important things of our society. Why, you know, like what happened? And uh, you know, like it, there are like three main reasons that I would like to analyze with you. Like the first one is that we are really measuring the wrong, the wrong indicators. Like there is a, a, a lot of interest in looking at the GDP, at economic growth, but you know, like which is pretty much how much we consume, you know? Your GDP can grow if you have a terrorist attack destroying the center of Odessa, you need to build shitload of money to reconstruct everything. But the GDP is saying that everything is going fine. But you know, like it doesn't take into account how many, how many people might have been suffering out of this and so on. What about uh, all the other things? Wealth distribution, better education, safe transportation, people happiness. It's all many times, you know, like all this interest on how much we are consuming. And it's not really like a comprehensive way of how society is going. Have I lost you? No. Awesome. Not yet. Not yet. I like that. <laughs> so, like, there is a second thing. The market is, uh, by definition, short term. Like, this is something that I learned in Brazil while finishing my MBA. You know, it's interesting because uh, the price of resources, the price of product or service, are created by demand and offer. And that's interesting because uh, the demand and, uh, like, the pricing for resources is actually defined by the market. And the market is us, people, living today. Which means that uh, there is no one representing the next generation and the one after, after the next generation saying how much stake they need of these resources. So we are simply putting a price to things that might be needed later, like only taking into account the people that are living today. So like the market is the biggest uh, factor for like short termism in society. Future generations are simply not part 
of the equation. And then like the third thing, which is like linear thinking, like uh, we have like uh, we got like to this really linear like a uh, left brain you know kind of society in which uh, we go like uh, in the consumerist society from extraction, production, distribution, consumption, and disposal in a very linear way. But you know it's interesting because uh, as we said before, is if it's true that we cannot have infinite economic growth in a finite planet, we cannot like keep using a linear system in a finite planet because we're going to run out of resources. And uh, you know there are statistics. You find always the sources in all my slides. You know, so in case that you think I'm inventing things, and it's interesting because if we all consume at the U.S. rate, we need three to five planets of resources, and we have only one. Let's look at the big picture and the entering like in each of the steps. Give me a sign to see if you're still alive. Alive, awesome. Everybody give us an eye. Like so, let's start from the extraction. The very first limit that we have is that we are really running out of resources. If you take Europe and the US combined, which are like the wealthiest uh, part regions in the planet, that accounts for 20% of the global population, we consume 60% of the global resources and we produce 60% of the global garbage, of the global waste. 75% of the global fishery, fisheries are currently beyond capacity, like 80% of the planet's original forests are gone, and uh, like, you know like what's happening uh, in Brazil, like I've seen it with my own eyes, the situation is getting better, but we're still like uh, taking away approximately seven football fields per minute, in terms of like how much trees we are taking off. That's a beautiful picture that like from Oregon, that's, uh, who knows what is tar sense? Raise your hand. Tar sense? You know, okay, sorry, I told you yesterday. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> uh, so this is like uh, the surface of England, like in uh, Ontario, no, in uh, Alberta, in Canada. They are trying to get petrol from sand in, a, in, a, in like the space which is like as big as a country. The tar sand is like, uh, the biggest open mine like ever made in history is the most polluting project that exists today in the world and uh, it became interesting to start extract extracting petrol from sand after that the barrel was uh, over 100 euros per dollar so they said uh, ah really okay then we'll let's use the tar sands like uh, the environmental disaster of the tar sands is incredible and it's interesting because Canada is not using, even using this petrol, but it's all for the US market, you know, genius. Um, so what happens to the local communities, uh, like uh, where there is like such uh, intense exploitation? Like uh, even though I'm Italian, I'm currently living in Romania that produces 30% of all the wood which is used by IKEA. And uh, it's interesting because uh, all the local communities that lose their natural resources, they are displaced, meaning, uh, that uh, this is even accelerating the trend that people are leaving the rural areas, it's happening also here in Ukraine, to go and live in big cities. In big cities that are getting like uh, bigger and bigger. Globally 200,000 people are, a day are moving to big cities. Big uh, as much as Mexico City, big as much as New Delhi, where people are ready to accept whatever kind of job. They're leaving uh, like the place where they could sustain their leaving until that moment, their natural resources are suddenly used by someone else, and then you know, they need to get the fuck out you know, and do something else. Production. This is like a, a picture like a, of a, a coal mine in the UK. Um, so like one of the main things like about production that is really striking, and uh, I suggest you like to go and check uh, like some sources that I'm more gonna be more than happy to give you is uh, the toxic chemicals uh, in uh, our products. When I was working for Procter and Gamble at some point, people told me that uh, the shampoos of Procter and Gamble, so and, and, um, Head and Shoulders and Pantene, they actually have toxic chemicals. So I, I actually was working like in France, like where there was uh, one of the biggest uh, production sites for the shampoos in Blois. And I went to ask one of these girls, you know, like because we got actually pretty close, and like asked, uh, is it true that there are toxic chemicals? Because it sounded like uh, this conspiracy theory. And she told me, 
for every shampoo against the dandruff, the kind of snow that goes from, out from your hair, there are always toxic chemicals. And uh, I was like, wow, interesting. Like, and uh, they are so open like, uh, to talk about this. And the company like, uh, makes uh, $89 billion of revenues. They should be able to find a fucking solution, right? Uh, so 84,000 uh, of the toxic chemicals that are used in the market are untested. And most, uh, most importantly, they don't do combined testing. I use a perfume, I use a shampoo, they have different toxic chemicals. They touch each other or like they, got, they come in touch. What's the effect? We have no idea. The stuff goes in our food, it goes in our bodies. And uh, the working conditions like of the people working in the production system many times are deplorable. Like uh, there was like uh, one of the big scandals that came out at the beginning of this year of a factory where several women, because women are the most uh, unfortunate like uh, element of the value chain because usually they are the ones that have the worst job and at the lowest wage. Like in uh, China, like those are like women that died, like there were several women that died in a production factory of iPad. There are like several interesting reports about uh, the just do it of Nike, like a really interesting picture. And uh, you know, like there are, this is like a, another picture like of a big problem that happened in uh, Bangladesh where like they produce most of the clothes in the world. And you know, like people are dying in this place. It's really interesting. And um, this is like a picture of what happened in Italy. Like a half of uh, the people working in the biggest steel production uh, in Europe, which is called Ilva. Right now, there is a huge scandal in Italy. And uh, like uh, half of these families, like they have uh, uh, like a high probability of getting cancer because like of all the working conditions were actually there. But you know, it's, that's the point, like when I was telling you, a lot of people are moving to big cities getting whatever kind of job because they have no option. What mother, like in a fertile age, would ever accept to work in such a place if not a woman with no option? What about the pollution? That's a fantastic thing because it's definitely one of the externalities of the production system. This is like a picture that was taken like of a man like uh, covering himself from the smell of the Yellow River in China, where most of the uh, big industries are actually releasing their toxic products. And uh, you know what we know for sure is that there is a love story between uh, CO2 and temperature. So the way they measure this kind of thing is that they go in uh, like the South Pole or the North North Pole. They take a big pile of ice and they start analyzing the level of CO2 like at each millimeter, which corresponds with H. So it means uh, the lowest you go, the more you see like uh, what was the temperature and the CO2 emission in a certain point in history. And uh, you see what everybody say that you know, the temperature moves like with cycles, which is fine. But uh, until today, we never got to the same CO2 emission that we have right now. And, uh, Nobody knows exactly what is going to be like the effect of uh, like such an increase of temperature. And I'm going to, and you know, like what we're experiencing already is that the weather is getting slightly more extreme. So it means that the weather is actually getting uh, more drought, more hurricanes. There are beautiful pictures of New York and like without electricity, which is like one of the centers of like today. Uh, like society, which is like left, uh, you know, in back in the 14th century. And uh, do you know what's calving? Awesome. I'm not gonna be able to show you all, otherwise, uh, like, uh, so like uh, this is. This is not working. I don't know. There is a sound here. No. So like, I don't know if you see this, but you know, these people have been in front of, uh, you know, like the North Pole, like they placed a camera and they stayed there for a few days because there is a phenomenon called calving, which is what you're seeing right now. This is uh, a piece of ice, which is as big as Manhattan, which is uh, getting out from the North Pole and uh, melting at the same time, turning around. So you see like this thing, it's impressive. And this is like the best uh, representation that we have of Calvin. It was uh, 
you can find like a fantastic uh, documentary that I recommend, which is Chasing Ice, in which you really see this phenomenon. They put cameras all over the coldest areas in the planet, and these cameras are taking one picture every five minutes. And they made a video of how, what is like, what is happening three years of time. Is it really happening? Fuck, it is. So like, this is a picture of uh, like what's happening, for example, in Norway, like uh, the water actually goes on the fundament of the ice and uh, let it slither away from the ground. And that's how the calving actually happens. The lead level of the, like, it's already talking about like four to seven meters, you know, like in the next hundred like, years. No? In the next hundred years, absolutely. Uh, which is, you know, which is a good news because we're not going to be there, but, you know, it's not really a good present for the future generation, right? And then, like, this is, like, uh, one of the main things uh, of our liberal economy today. When I speak with my friends that are, like, uh, that they did the same business school that I did, that they tell me the market can auto-regulate. When the situation is going to be so fucked up that uh, really global warming is going to become a priority, then the market is going to start investing on, more, on greener technology. And we're going to like reduce our CO2 emission. But again, this is like again a problem of the linear thinking. What does it mean? The planet does not work linearly. Even if we stop our CO2 emissions from a day to another, we're not going to come back to how the planet was like uh, 1,500 years ago. And that's because uh, it does not respond linearly. And uh, we are getting to a point in which it might be too late, and the auto-regulation of the market is going to sound like a joke. Are you still with me? Yeah. It's a long way, huh? So, like, we're talking about today, like, these are a few books. I didn't read them all, but, you know, I read, like, uh, Climate Wars, like, and Climate Wars, and Climate Wars. Like, it's all about Climate Wars, in fact. That, you know, like, uh, they're talking about uh, is global warming like and this like this entire process that we have started gonna undermine our capability as a society to live peacefully and uh, I show you like an example that uh, regards Ukraine you know the Arab Spring you heard it you see the people in the streets in Egypt and so on what happened 2010 like there has been a huge draft that has like interested four key countries that uh, are selling wheat for producing bread to Egypt, Canada, Ukraine, China, and Russia. This is like an article from The Guardian, like with Vladimir Putin, like uh, putting a ban to, in that year, to sell any kind of grain, because the draft has caused like uh, to decimate the population of grain. And uh, when people in the Egypt couldn't, uh, couldn't make bread anymore, that's how like, they got actually to start protesting on the streets. It was like uh, somehow an externality of global warming to have uh, the Arab Spring. But it's not finished here. Let's talk about Bangladesh. We in Europe usually don't care about Bangladesh. We maybe sometimes read that our stuff was produced there. But uh, Bangladesh, it's uh, one of the lowest countries in the world, exactly like the Netherlands. They are underwater. 150 million people are going to be displaced because the country is disappearing and uh, they don't have the same system of folders that they have in Holland to protect them like from the increasing le level of water. The salty water is going in the field and is making it impossible to produce any kind of uh, crop. And uh, at the border between Bangladesh and India, they're shooting Bangladeshi people as soon as they try to come. Because India knows that this is like uh, gonna be, it's like it's a pressure pot. It's gonna explode at some point. Yemen and its second biggest city, it's called Thais. The biggest city of Yemen, another country for which uh, we don't listen to much in television, is that uh, they ran out of water. There is only one source of available water in the second biggest city of a country. And the people are shooting themselves, and I suggest you to watch like the documentary made by um, uh, James Cameron, the same movie maker that made Titanic, Avatar, and so on. He made also a documentary on global warming, which is called uh, Years of Living Dangerously. 
and they have pictured how people shooting themselves on the street to get water. Take a break, okay? And then like, and now we continue because this is, uh, this is not over. Like, and now we get to distribution, okay? In the distribution, you know, like uh, the entire point is to sell, uh, to, put, to, to keep the price down, sell things as fast as possible, and keep the inventories moving as fast as possible. I don't know what you're working on, guys, but if you are working like with companies, you know that this is the entire point, like of uh, having a company, you know, like, uh, and uh, I'm a company as well, and trust me, like I completely understand this mentality because this is business. The entire point is that uh, I love this picture of uh, like the high cost of low price like that they made for Walmart. But uh, there are, how do they keep like the price low? One of the big problems like in distribution is that uh, usually they try to save money on uh, insurance of, of the workers. There are many people complaining that the wages that they're paying. In Romania like uh, a worker working for Carrefour because my wife when she arrived uh, in Romania started saying let's try to make it a little more stable. She got a French contract to work in Romania for Carrefour, and uh, her employees were paid 180 euros per uh, month, which is uh, really not enough to live in Bucharest. You know, like it's uh, a, well, the kind of minimum salary, which is like uh, not helping anyone. So, like this is one of the ways to save money. But uh, the real way to save money is externalities, meaning uh, you're not paying the cost of the shit that you're buying. <coughs> Not the real cost. What does it mean? Why like a salad costs more than a Big Mac? Or like why when you buy, you know, these kind of bio products that have been made uh, like in a natural way, like this is super expensive and uh, most of us cannot afford it, you know, to have this kind of healthy life all the time. And that's because uh, there is a hidden price between many of the products that we buy. In the case of the Big Mac, like this is a picture that I didn't make it, but you know, I found it funny, you know, like there is a environmental cost, the cruelty, the healthcare cost, the subsidies, and I would say like, what about the unhealthy practices of growing the cows uh, in a way that, uh, you know, like it's not really the best way from the human health? What about the low wages of the people working at McDonald's? So the point is that, uh, for this, for the plastic bag, all over the value chain, going from extraction to disposal, people that are in the system are paying for your low price, which means that uh, there are people in the extraction that are paying with the loss of their natural resources. There are people that are paying because they lost their clean air. There are people that are paying because they lost uh, their social insurance or social service uh, and because like they are losing their health. So this is cost externalities. This, is, this means actually that someone else is paying the rest of the bill for the things that you buy. And uh, it does not exist an accounting as easy as the one that we use for financial accounting to take into account this contribution. Social impact assessment is probably one of the most difficult things to do today. There are, like that I know, 1,043 different methods for measuring impact assessment, but we will come to this later. Consumption, like this is a picture of Black Friday in Haida. The interesting thing of consumption is that uh, it has become like one of the main thing, like one of the main activities like in our living. You know, like we're consuming approximately twice as we did 50 years ago. You find the source. And the interesting thing is that we're also consuming not, not only a lot of products that we don't need many times, but also we are, you know, like uh, getting a lot of products of really, really low quality. Also in our food, we are like, the, in, it's the first time in history in which we have a coexistence of people starving and obese people, like ever. And you know, the obese people, it's the new poverty many times, because those are people, they cannot afford to eat uh, food that was grown in a decent way. And they go to McDonald's and they spend less for like the, ha the Happy Meal or the Big Mac than for the salad. It's all related to poverty, it's all related like to the quality of life that you're actually having. So the question is that uh, how did we end up in this uh, ridiculous situation, you know? Because, uh, you know, this is clear. We can find all the sources to understand what the hell is happening. There is like a plant versus perceived obsolescence, which means uh, 
we're going to see it now. Planned obsolescence, it is when uh, your stuff is designed to break down. The best example to explain how everything started, uh, have you ever been to Buckingham Palace in the, in the UK? In Buckingham Palace, like there is a light bulb which is famous because it was manufactured in 800, 1890, and it's still working. And uh, when people ask themselves, wow, like a light bulb like that, why the hell I don't find them in supermarket, you know? And um, the main idea is that uh, when in the 1920s they noticed that uh, if you want to really create an economy, you cannot make something that is going to break in 300 years. Otherwise, like you have an NGO, you know, like uh, you cannot really grow your business. So they started like look, working on the filament to make sure that the filament would actually be able to break in around seven years. So like uh, there is a way to calculate what is going to be the obsolescence, so how long it is going to last, how fast it is going to become old of the things that you buy. And uh, this is like uh, one of the main factors for Western economy wealth. The fact that we keep consuming. The second thing is the so-called uh, perceived obsolescence, which is like convincing people to throw away stuff that is still, it still works, it's still good, but you throw it away anyway. Telephones, you know, like, or like um, fashion, like I come from a country where, where, where perceived obsolescence is essential. All my friends in Italy, they're spending shitload of money on, on changing like their Prada t-shirt like as often as possible. Because you remember in the 1980s when we had this like sports suit that are really, really fucking ugly. Like nobody, like if you would, a friend of yours would come out with you like with something like that, it would be like, oh man, like this is wrong, you know, like, are you serious? But that's the point, you know? This is, there is like such an internal pressure on our brain about uh, what is not cool anymore, you know, like what you don't want to wear. And there are so many people that still have this stuff at their home that it's sitting there completely fine, but perceived obsolescence, it's time to like get it out, get rid of it. Are you following? TV advertising or advertising in general, like is playing a big role, like each of us is targeted with more than 3,000 advertisements per day. This is like the New York Times saying that. And the interesting thing is that uh, we are like, uh, advertising is telling you nothing else than you suck. Really, like you really suck unless you buy this kind of thing that is gonna be life changing. And most of the times we really don't need all these things to be happy. So I really do suggest you to check. <laughs> <laughs> So I really do suggest you to go and check the last the happiness report 2015 to see really whether we're really getting happier as a society. Is it the thing that we're buying that make us happy? Or is it the fact of like spending time with people, you know, like having, having a good relationship? Uh, like, uh, it's like, what is, put it like to the hand, to the bottom line. What makes us happy? And it's not consumption. You wonder I could have worked like PNG before that. <laughs> So like, let's talk about this puzzle. This is like the last part of the chain. Usually what happens with this puzzle, like there are two main ways. Either you make a hole in the, in the floor, in the ground, and you put all your stuff there, or you burn it, and then you put it on the floor. And uh, it's interesting because when you burn the toxic chemicals that you put in the production, you actually produce a, a super toxic uh, uh, substance which is called dioxin. And uh, according to, like, uh, like dioxin is the most toxic man-made substance known to science. It doesn't exist anything as uh, healthy, unhealthy like uh, as dioxin. And incinerators, which are the places where you burn and you put fire to the uh, garbage, are the number one source of dioxin. So it means that every time, like it would be enough to like uh, make sure that we don't burn the trash to avoid producing dioxin, which is like the worst substance ever produced by mankind. And you know, like uh, this is like uh, 15 minutes. Oh my God, we are late, guys. We're late. We need to <laughs> go faster. So like, uh, let's talk about electronic waste. This is happening in Ghana, where most of your electronic shit is gonna finish. This is happening in Bangladesh, where most of your clothes are manufactured. 
this is awesome. Like, uh, this is fantastic. Like, look at this picture. Look at it well. It's uh, like a way, a bay in Java in Indonesia where the local communities that were displaced because they started developing tourism, they have no idea where to put their trash. And uh, it's finishing simply in the seaside. So two things are infinite according to Einstein. The universe and human stupidity. But maybe human stupidity is really, really much larger, you know? Who is doing something to solve the situation? NGOs have been one of the key actors working along the value chain to make sure that things will actually go right. The big problem according to the United Nations and to like the OECD is that uh, the money for supporting NGOs or for supporting social innovation is decreasing. And uh, the point is that, uh, look at that one, you know, like 100,000 NGOs killed by the crisis the big problem of NGOs is that uh, if you don't give them money, they die. They need money to survive. And uh, this kind of economic model cannot work forever. What's the role of business in the picture that we have given you until now? The role of business is the one of uh, maximizing shareholders' value. Full stop. That's it. Don't ask anything else that is beyond this main objective. Then if you can do things clear or nice, but no, it has still to comply within this objective. Maximizing shareholders' value. And it's funny because like for me, we got like a society that is trying to go in one direction, you know, like a, you know, solving the biggest problems, which is trying like to get uh, to healthy products and so on. And then the corporate are not really helping a lot. So like a, a question that I always ask to myself when I meet a company is like, uh, what is your role as a part of society? How are you making everybody's life better? And how are you measuring your impact? Are you really doing like a good job or like, you know, what's, what's, why are you there? You know, why do you exist, you know? Is it really good what they're doing? So like a person that changed the entire perspective is Muhammad Yunus. Nobel Prize winner for the microcredit, uh, board of the Grameen Bank, and expert in microcredit. And this guy started talking about social business. He started talking about uh, why businesses uh, should not be able to make money, but also like promote environmental quality and make sure that there is social equity. He started like promoting like a way to say business can be actually the solution to all this. Because business is the most thriving element of our, our society. It, like said, seven principles for social business. The one that uh, the social business first mission is not to maximize profit, but it's to solve a problem. It can be the one of education, it can be the one of poverty, it can be like the one of the environment, but it is like mission driven. The second thing that he said is that uh, it's a business. Social business is not, a, is not an NGO. It's making enough money to survive. Investors can put money in a social business, but they get exactly back the money that they put. This is really criticized by impact investors. And then like, when investment is paid back, all the profit of these companies are always reused on the mission, not on dividends for the shareholders. Sorry, I'm dying. And then, environmentally conscious, it means like uh, you're not doing things like not taking into account of like the environment that is surrounding you. And uh, the people that are working in these companies are treated decently. And then like the guy is a bit kitsch, so he says, do it with joy. But, so like there is a paradigm shift in our business in which we start combining charity and capitalism for a new sustainable capitalism where companies are actually bringing the change that is necessary to create a sustainable society. <clears throat> How did everything start? Grameen Danone, like Danone, the company producing the yogurt, started working together with uh, Muhammad Yunus to, pre to create uh, yogurts that, are, that cost only five euro cent per unit that they sell to the poor kids in Bangladesh. 
And those are super yogurts with a lot of nu nutrients. You don't want to give it to your children, otherwise they're gonna become super fat. But uh, it's interesting because they rethought the entire model, and I've been speaking like with a, with a few people, like a Danone in France, they told me, usually to produce like a, a factory in France, it costs us around 100 million euros. In uh, Bangladesh, to make this kind of yogurts, we need to rethink, we needed to rethink completely how we could make money selling for five cents. And so they have remade uh, a completely different production system, and the factory cost uh, 600,000 euros compared to 100 million. So it's interesting because social business, to serve the bottom of the pyramid, the lowest like uh, caste aware, it's really also rethinking the way that we need to do things to make sure that you can really bring the value to these people that have no money. Other Grameen initiatives, Grameen Bank, giving money to women, borrowing money to women so that they can start their own business and then they give the money back. Grameen Health uh, Healthcare Trust, providing services to rich people and then subsidizing for the poor people. Bus Grameen, producing mosquito nets to prevent malaria, and they sell like the very good quality one for rich families, and then like they sell like at the very, very low price for like the poor families that couldn't afford it. Grameen Adidas, Adidas make the first pair of shoes that cost one dollar, and they make money out of selling the shoes. Check it out, the Telegraph. Like, uh, this is like one of the best uh, examples of what uh, everything is done with Grameen from uh, Muhammad Yunus. <coughs> What's now? So like, it's interesting because the social enterprises, and now I want to like cheer you up. I want to give you like good examples that are gonna like say, okay, we're not dying, you know, there is something happening. So social enterprises impacting the entire value chain that we have seen before. Value chain from uh, extraction to disposal. Social enterprises are helping all over like the, the chain. We were saying before, the planet is limited, fantastic, we got solution. Ecopathic design, an IOS company that is solving the problem of polystyrene. Polystyrene is this kind of white stuff that you find everywhere. This is like a, one of the elements in nature that is using the highest amount of petrol and uh, it takes like over 100,000 years to be, uh, like, uh, to be recycled. And this guy like said, okay, fantastic. He found like this kind of special mushroom. They mix it with uh, agricultural waste. So like this kind of thing, like that waste from agriculture. They put it in this kind of shape, depending on what kind of shape you want to create. They put it in darkness. The, the fungus is gonna work for three days alone, without need of anyone like putting anything. And at the end of the day, you have uh, whatever kind of shape you want, which is a perfect substitute of the polystyrene. And the awesome thing is that this thing, you throw it in your garden, and that's bio biodegradable. And this is like a part of like something that we're gonna see later. It's part of the circular economy. When like uh, you're not producing waste anymore, and as, as someone say, waste, it's bad design. Merveg, like this is something, this is not like exactly a social business, but this is like a fantastic social activity. When, that when they told me, hey Manu, we're getting to Europe, are you ready? I thought that we're, we're gonna get all the best ideas from Europe to do like, uh, to improve every country. In Germany, instead of using this kind of stuff that I'm gonna be using, and then like it's gonna be, become trash immediately, they use uh, thicker plastic, uh, plastic bottles that are like much higher quality than these ones that you can reuse, you know? You reuse uh, them all the time. So it means that uh, you don't waste energy for the recycling. And when you recycle thing, things, you're not really use saving all the raw material. So the best way to actually do things is reusing things. And you know, like this is like really putting up, decreasing the pressure that we have on extracting resources on the planet. Upside down, please stand up, please, you know, like. Uh, upside down, like, uh, it's a fantastic project from Romania. Andres is gonna talk about these things tomorrow. Like, they're taking advertisement banners, this kind of stuff that after one month, they need to remove it. Yeah, <laughs> I will try as fast as possible, I promise. And they do something which is called upcycle. It means like you give a second life to certain products that were gonna become trash. And what do they produce? 
like bags, wallets, all the things that you cannot imagine could be done from something that was going to actually become trash. I'm not going to spoil more, okay? Thank you. Interface US, like uh, luxury products for the apartment uh, that are made like from 49% uh, of recycled bio-based raw material. Like, uh, and that's impressive because like, they're finding solutions to increase the amount of raw material which is recycled that is used. Leaf supply from, which from, coming from France. They use like recycled material to produce uh, these kind of solutions in case, for example, there is a earthquake or there is like a, you know like a, a problem. And uh, it's really interesting because right now, after the problem in um, Nepal, after the earthquake, they were one of the best suppliers of like this solution for enabling people to sleep, like to find a way to like organize like in a, in a moment of like extreme. Uh, uncertainty. The idea is that uh, we're getting to a book that I really suggest you to read. It's called Cradle to Cradle. This is a picture of uh, cherry trees. You know the cherry, right? The beautiful thing of the cherry trees, as they say in the book, is that uh, this is absolutely amazing to walk into something like that, but nature never does things in a wasteful way. So it means that all these beautiful leaves that are falling down to the floor are later on going to become compost for the same floor. So it means that there is a recycling and like a closed loop kind of uh, nature that enables things that are waste to become useful for something else in the process. Nature does that, and in Denmark, like this, they made like uh, the Kuhn uh, Kuhn board, sorry. Symbiosis, in which they took uh, several organizations and they found the perfect loop to make sure that whatever waste an organization was producing, it was becoming actually a raw material for another organization. We were talking about global warming, right? We know like was producing global warming, and uh, trust me, like if you look at cows. Whenever a cow farts, it's really like making more global warming than you can possibly imagine. Like the CO2 emission also coming from capital, it's like impressive. But uh, there are like already solutions that are being proposed. Jeremy Rifkin, does it ring a bell? Jeremy Rifkin, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so like, uh, uh, Jeremy Rifkin like is one of the uh, consultants or people like Angela Merkel, like working also for the US president and so on, which is producing like the third industrial revolution kind of uh, uh, approach, which is based on five pillars, which is like a fuel cell vehicle, intelligent grid or smart grid that are connecting all the uh, energy buildings like that. So every building like uh, is gonna have like renewable energy sources. All the buildings are gonna be connected in a smart grid, and uh, instead of having big production site, every small building is producing its energy and exchanging it like with its neighbors. So rather than having like the energy loss that we have like in this centralization, centralized production, we're actually like using all this uh, like a interconnected uh, network of houses producing uh, energy. And how do we store them? with uh, the fuel cell vehicles. So like uh, you use uh, electric vehicles in order to store the energy which is produced by like all these individual buildings. And that's interesting because they're already doing uh, some experiments and the most advanced are in Paris in which the municipality invested for something called uh, Autolib which is uh, you know like this kind of free bicycle, no not free bicycle but the public bicycle system that you find in most of the city there you have a public uh, electric vehicle system offered to everybody, which costs a little bit of money and you have all over the city all the stations where you can recharge the car and you can go, really? Uh, okay, I need like five more minutes, okay? Italian minutes, huh? No, okay. <laughs> No, okay. Um, so this is like otherwise biodigester from Alex Eaton, which is uh, uh, has developed a system to use the um, the methane that comes from the excre excrements of animals, and they are using this like uh, in all South America to enable poor uh, farmers to generate uh, uh, biogas that they're gonna use like for cooking things. Sino forest, 
This guy is like a, re, like a find, found a way and a kind of tree that in certain condition grows extremely fast and they can use this kind of tree without actually touching the natural forests. Intensive agriculture, we know what's the problem, like of our soils getting poorer and poorer and poorer and there are like extremely interesting agriculture or permaculture solution in which people like uh, Peter Coppert from his company called Coppert are actually combining insects with other plants and so on to make sure that you have a synergy between like all the elements. Okay. You have a synergy between all the elements that are like uh, working like uh, in the agricultural sector. Duck revolution in Japan that's even cooler. He is using ducks in the rice plantation to eliminate most of the weeds, remove all the harmful in, uh, insects, and the ducks are actually like uh, acting as a fertilizer for the rice. And they are like exporting this kind of. And the ducks are, car uh, are like uh, are currently exporting this kind of methodology, like with this particular Chinese uh, Japanese ducks outside of it. What about responsible consumption? La Rushki di Wii. There are several producers in the agricultural environment that live in rural areas and uh, they have no big shoulders compared to Carrefour. Carrefour like, is, never, is gonna buy their milk, is gonna buy their stuff at ridiculous prices and they cannot access the market differently. Guillaume Cheron like, uh, is a guy that is taking this produce from all the different rural areas and bringing them to the people that are working in big companies in Paris, for example. And I was receiving every week my package of uh, like fresh produce that was organic, bio, and so on, straight away like uh, to my place. The price was cheaper because there were not intermediaries, and it was like giving a good price for the people that were actually cultivating this stuff. Good guide, USA, like uh, a kind of smartphone application to tell you oh, how bad or how good is a company product that you're actually buying, like with. Uh, what kind of uh, an information about what kind of material toxic or not toxic people are using? Food revolution. Jamie Oliver like is doing courses for kids in the UK to teach them to eat like in a healthy way because you know there is this kind of problem I was telling you before. The sharing economy is also like a big chunk like of the change. Defined by Rachel Bootsman, like about uh, that, con it doesn't mean that we need to consume like in a very individualistic way. We can actually go do this kind of collaborative consumption, you know. And uh, the age of access, like from Jeremy Rifkin, this sentence is fantastic. This new status symbol is not what you own, but it's like what you're smart enough not to own. Fantastic book that I really recommend you read. The collaborative economy is going from consumption to production to finance, learning, and governance. You have to kick me out. Kind of huh? <laughs> okay. So you know blah blah car like for car share, sharing. Huh? We we have blah blah car in Ukraine. Yeah, don't worry. That's why I got it. <laughs> How much, how much time do we honestly have? Uh, we actually have no time at all <laughs> because the next speaker is sitting right in this audience. <laughs> all right. Yeah. So like uh, this is one of the best examples. I'm not gonna say to you. I'm not gonna say to you. I'm gonna go like uh, straight away. I'm sorry, guys. Like uh, <laughs> like uh, there are many comments to and let's talk. You know later. You know like. Uh, we will share the presentation with us. Huh? Yeah, I would like send a PDF. It's fine. But, uh, well, like... How we, much How much more do you have? Can you give me five? Uh, can we give five yes, minutes yeah. to Manel? Is it okay? Is yeah, it yes, okay? Yes, yes, yes. The final part is so interesting. Okay, yes. five minutes. <laughs> Good. I'm sorry, like... Uh, but it wasn't it one hour at the beginning? It was 45 minutes. Whatever, yeah. like, uh, so open source ecology, like, because also the crowd is having, like, a big impact on this. Marcin Chubowski, like, uh, the story is fantastic, but pretty much what he did, it was uh, open source, like, all these projects about how to produce agricult agricultural or, like, uh, equipment, put it online, and right now there is a community of 100,000 people working, like, to reuse this stuff, rather than, like, buying already made solutions that are going to be destroyed much faster. Uh, fold it in the USA. These guys made a game to actually get people to fold proteins to solve problems like AIDS. 
and uh, there are 80,000 players online playing to actually fold proteins, and they are actually helping the research going much faster, playing, playing a game. Open source garden in the apartment. Uh, Brita really is using the same technology that they used to grow marijuana in uh, Amsterdam, which is like a, um, a hydroponic like technology, to actually have uh, urban, no, like uh, house gardens. And it's interesting because uh, they managed to get to reduce the CO2 emission of a person in a half just like by producing like several products in a super efficient way that people can actually use in their apartment. Open IDEO, like fantastic example from the UK on how to use like the crowd to solve uh, massive problems through collective design thinking. So like you ask a big question to people like how can we help social innovation grow in Ukraine? And people go from inspiration, giving like uh, ideas of what exists already, giving ideas that can actually help the thing to happen, voting, refining, evaluating. This process lasts uh, like one month or two months and people collaborate in each step of the process, like helping to go as in a funnel, from the main ideas until you get to the thing that you can actually implement. And then finally, malaria spot, which is a guy that is taking like blood cell samples and is using a game to let people recognize the blood cells that have malaria. And uh, these people, by playing the game, are helping real cases of malaria, like uh, in uh, developing parts of the world. And finally, like, uh, let me tell you something about us, you know, like as well, which is like, uh, we started doing like a, a crazy thing that was like uh, combining three different markets. The market of social innovation, the market of crowdsourcing, and the market of lean startup. So like, we started simply saying, uh, we take social enterprises and social innovations that right, really need to be scaled, we take all their assumptions are the, in the lean startup, and uh, we combine these with uh, enabling all the stakeholders that can help these ideas becoming viable, validate all the assumptions through the crowd. And so like, uh, we actually are using uh, collective intelligence to help social innovations find the right answers about how to become sustainable businesses. And uh, we currently like, are working with 850 social enterprises from 103 countries. Let's finish. Yes, we can. <laughs> the market is gaining momentum. Like, uh, there is, however, like, a big mess about what the hell is social innovation. You know? like, people, they really don't understand many times what the hell is in or like, how to measure impact. So like, I'm going to give you, like, many people like, still don't even know the difference between social innovation and social entrepreneurship. And so the kind of face that I usually get when I ask the people, so what's the difference is this one. Like, uh. <laughs> so what is the last slide for today? It's a, again an example about DKK in Germany. Nobody has heard of this company. And the reason is because this company, like uh, in the 1980s, like uh, you know the story, chlorofluorocarburi, I have no idea in Ukrainian or in English, but it's the thing that was causing the ozone depletion. So the ozone was getting like a, a, a hole because of a, a gas which is released by fridge. Greenpeace developed a technology that was called Green Freeze with a collaboration of 30 scientists from all over the world. And this DKK was the first company to produce the fridges like from Eastern Germany and sell them all over. 35 million domestic green freeze are currently produced yearly. 400 million tons of CO2 emissions have been avoided with this technology. And DKK failed because uh, every other company copied the technology. And that's fantastic. Meaning uh, the guys didn't take a patent for this technology. And uh, if they would have taken a patent, probably, we would have never been so efficient in solving the problem. And so I ask you, what the hell is the role of openness in social innovation? If things are not open, then you cannot like, enable the participation of other actors that can help solving the problem. You cannot replicate the best initiatives from a place to another one. And then like, you cannot actually like, work in a smart way using the collective intelligence of the people in the planet. And ultimately, we cannot stop reinventing the wheel. So be open. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Sorry for um, no, I'm really sorry, uh, but trying to be... <laughs>